Right, welcome back then to another episode of the GCN Tech Clinic, where we try and solve your bike related problems. So if you've got a tech issue which has been plaguing you and you just cannot fix it, leave it down there in the comment section below and I'll do my very best to try and solve it in an upcoming episode. Let's crack on. First question this week comes in from Alexander Vendelbo, who says, Hi John, I have a touring frame with V-brakes or cantilever mounts and an eight-speed Claris group set. Will the brakes stroke shifters work with V-brakes or canties? Have a gravel build in mind. Right, Alexander, uh, either type will work with those uh, STI levers you've got on there. The canties, they will work most likely straight away and don't need any modifications or playing around with whatsoever because the, uh, the pull of the cable works fine with that. If you're gonna go ahead and put some V-brakes on there, uh, because of the way that linear pull brakes work, your road bike brake levers won't be able to pull quite enough cable for the V-brakes to work efficiently or effectively. So what I suggest here is to get something called a travel agent. I believe they're made by a company called Problem Solvers, believe it or not. They make all sorts of little wizardry and gadgets to try and fix problems that we tend to find as we try and have cross compatibility issues with things. So anyway, this is a little wheel uh, which routes the cable around it. So when you pull on it, that wheel pulls more cable than intended. It's a great little bit of kit and loads of people do use them. So that's what I'd suggest if you wanna put the V-brakes on there. Okay, next question comes in from Juan Antonio Monzon who says, hi John, I recently uh, bought an old Peugeot frame. I need a bottom bracket, but I don't know which kind it has on it. Uh, I bought a standard BSA and just one side of the cup screws correctly in, but the other side doesn't at all. Could you tell me what kind of bottom bracket I need? I also want to build this bike with just one chain ring and a six or seven speed uh, block on the back, so the shifting from the down tube is easier. Which ratios would I recommend? I was thinking to get inspired by cyclocross and use a 48 in the front and 1126 in the back, as I won't be hitting any hard climbs with this bike. I'd be really happy if you could just help out with this. Thanks in advance. Okay, uh, let's tackle the ratios one first. Whatever you can get really, uh, with a six or seven speed free will, because you're not necessarily gonna have that many options out there. Uh, and providing, of course, you're not gonna tackle any hills, you should be all right. But when it comes to your bottom bracket question, here we go. Okay, uh, BSA threads. Uh, when it comes to bottom brackets. If you look at the bike side on from each side when I'm talking about this, left hand side, it tightens in a clockwise direction for BSA or British thread, English thread, whatever you want to call it. On the right hand side, anti-clockwise or counterclockwise. Then for an Italian threaded frame, both sides tighten clockwise if you're looking from the side. Of course, a French frame with Italian threads, probably fairly unlikely, I've got to say, more likely to have a French threaded bottom bracket, uh, which tightens in the same way as an Italian one, but the thread pitch is different again. Quite rare. Uh, if in doubt, I'd pop along to a local bike shop that should have a tool which could easily identify exactly what it is you've got on there. But I'd say it's unlikely to be Italian, more likely BSA or French. The old French threaded ones, that's not gonna be that easy to find. eBay will be your friend. Right, now we've got a question in from Quince uh, Mothman, who says, Hi John, I'm a bit concerned with how deep into a bike frame you can fit the seat post. Being of a short height, I ride a Villier that is extra small in its frame size. Uh, this is my correct frame size and the saddle height looks fine. However, I still have to fit the seat post a little deeper than the marker printed on it. Should I have it shortened or not worry? No one seems to talk about this, only the minimum amount. Right, nice question. Uh, now, unless you're having to really ram that seat post in for it to go down low enough, then really there's nothing to worry about. Of course, there is an exception here. So if you had a uh, aero shaped seat tube, so it's like a standard profile, and then maybe there's a cutout in it one way or another, if you were to put that seat post in too far, it could well pop out of the actual uh, the frame tube there or the seat tube. So that'd be something to be aware of. Like you say, no one really talks about how much seat posts can go inside of a frame. It's always about how much you must have in it. Um, but that sort of maximum insertion depth, I guess you could just cut the seat post down a very small amount just to allow it to go down and satisfy it really so it just uh, covers up that uh, bit of detailing on the seat post. Without seeing it though, it is really, really difficult to actually help with it. 
What I'd suggest doing in this case, because obviously you don't want to go invalidating a warranty of either component, is take photos of the actual parts, send it off to the relevant manufacturers, so Villia, uh, you haven't said who the seat post is made by, but just send it off and explain the whole situation and show actually, you could hold the seat post next to the frame and show how much seat post is inside of it, uh, by removing it of course, and then they could advise you either way on what to do on it, but I can't really help any further on that one. Next up we've got Andrew Bruce who says, hi John, I've picked up an old Gitan Tandem for very little money which I intend to refurbish and restore. However, I don't know whether it would make more sense to upgrade the components to more modern ones to cope with the demands of modern roads or stick with the old tech of the 80s and stay faithful to the era or a combination of both old and new, i.e. old cranks with modern mechs, shifters and brakes. What do you think would be more desirable by the wider audience? Oh, right, okay, Andrew. Um, You've got to go with what you want to go. Don't listen to all the other people around you. But ultimately, my experience with tandems is relatively limited. And I know there are a few compatibility things to work out there too. Maybe you've got hub brakes on there. So they're uh, different, of course, to disc brakes or rim brakes. So things like that have to be considered. But ultimately, the newer components are going to really work better because let's face it, technology has moved on quite a bit. You've said it's come from the 80s, so just be aware of that. You know, 80s tech was good, but well, modern tech is even better, I reckon. So I'd go ahead with that, but where compatibility limits it, well, you're gonna be limited there, aren't you, really? Uh, send in a picture of it, because I'm loving the idea of a retro tandem build. Right, next up is Nilo Neumann, who says, is it a bad idea to store a non-steel road bike in the bathroom? Would the moisture do any damage to the bike? All right, funny you say this, a couple of mates of mine who used to, who used to uh, rent a house together, they used to actually have a bike on a turbo trainer set up in their bathroom. What their thought process was, I do not know, but it's on screen right now. Uh, really odd memories really of going around to their house ever. But I would say it probably would have a slight adverse effect on any metal components on your bike. Because you've said there, it's a non-steel road bike, but generally moisture tends to be attracted to the coldest things. So on your bike, it's gonna be your drivetrain, possibly your levers, your bottle cages, I don't know, whatever is on it, which is gonna be cold. Because if you think really inside of a cold house, moisture always seems to form on windows, bits of steel in the bathroom, things like that. So I wouldn't have it laying around in your bathroom. That's just one word of advice. Right, next up is Vincent Nopper, who says, Hi, Mr. Cannings, I have got two questions. Right, we'll tackle them in turn then, I think. Uh, I want to clean and regrease my headset, but my fork is stuck and I can't get it out of my bike. I can wiggle it after removing everything, as in your how-to video, but it won't come loose. What to do? Hammer it out? Right, okay, good question, this one. Uh, you are gonna use a little bit of force here. So you haven't said if it's got a uh, carbon steerer or anything, but remove as much of the headset and the, uh, the actual stem and everything like that as possible. Get yourself a decent bit of wood, quite sturdy, and put that on top of the steerer tube. And with, you know, not a big hammer, don't go, don't go using a, you know, an ax or a sledgehammer or anything like that, but use what I like to call a toffee hammer or uh, just like a mid-weight hammer. Give it a few taps on that bit of wood. That should free it up and then the forks should come out. Of course, here you want to make sure that if it does do that, that it does eventually come out, if the headset bearings are shot in the lower part of the uh, headset cup, that they don't fly out everywhere because you may well need to know exactly the size of them and everything for the replacements to go in there. So just be cautious of that. Maybe put down a big sheet so that anything that falls down can easily be found and they're not gonna roll away and get lost anywhere. Anyway, second question. Uh, I recently got myself a new shiny gold chain. Well done. Uh, after I put it on and fine tune the gearing on the 105 5800 group set, the shifting is perfectly smooth, but not when the chain is on one of the two smallest sprockets on the cassette. Uh, then it jumps up a little bit as if there is a bump on the cogs. What do you think of this? Right, firstly, uh, let's make sure that the hanger is nice and straight, so the gear hanger, because it could well just be playing havoc with those last two sprockets. Also, make sure that the uh, inner cable is possibly not kinked or bent at all and that it's not getting caught up and it's not allowing the derailleur just to move into that perfect position. And I guess something as well to consider here, you've got no stiff links in the chain, so run it very smoothly around, so very slowly around backwards uh, with your bike either in a work stand or on the floor and just have a look, because quite often you can detect just a stiff link there. If you've got one, hold the chain in your hands like so, 
and flex it back and forwards, so uh, laterally in, in its plane. Uh, and what else could I suggest to you with this one? Sounds silly. Make sure that the sprockets are on in the correct orientation because you could fit them in reverse because the splines will likely line up, or it could possibly do anyway, uh, and the shifting ramps, they may not be working correctly. So try out those ones and let me know how you get on. Right next up, we've got Laszlo's Lot Herder. I hope I've said that one correct. Uh, hi John, indoor training season is on. And I just ordered my first ever trainer, a direct drive one. Is there any preparation I should do that stress and sweat won't damage my pride and joy? Oh yeah, you don't want to damage that. Uh, also, should I use the trainer with a brand new cassette or with the one that's currently on the rear wheel? Your professional tips and thoughts are highly appreciated. Right, okay, uh, I'd get a new cassette for the direct drive trainer. The reason being, you don't have to worry about swapping it backwards and forwards. And also it's gonna last you a pretty long time because remember, it's not gonna get dirty, is it, on an indoor trainer. So go ahead and do that one. Uh, as for stress, I've never seen a bike break personally, you know, firsthand through stress on a direct drive trainer or anything. I know people out there have said they've seen it, but well, I've never seen one in all my years. Uh, as for sweat, yeah, be really, really cautious about this because once sweat gets in there and it starts to work away on your components, it could well be bad news. So after using it, uh, your direct drive trainer and your frame, get a fresh towel, not the one you've been mopping up your face and getting rid of all that sweat because that's gonna be covered in sweat and if you wipe the bike down with it, all you're doing is just transferring it back onto the bike. So get a fresh towel or a bit of cloth, something like that, and wipe it away. And use something like WD-40 or Muck Off MO94, I think it's called, just spray bolt heads and things like that with it. Uh, I always do that just as a bit of prevention because it's amazing how that sweat can get down and start corroding away at your headset, for instance, and you don't even realize it's happening. Right then, the next one comes in from possibly one of the weirdest usernames ever. My brother is not a pig, has said, John, keep up the good work. Large dilemma here. I have a Shimano Tiagra group set and I've replaced plenty of Holotech 2 bottom brackets during owning the bike. But my last bottom bracket, uh, I made a blunder and I forgot to add grease on the threads and now my left hand BB is seized shut. Same thing happened a year ago and my local bike shop managed to hacksaw the bottom bracket cup uh, from the frame. The removal tool they used was like the part tool BBT9, which is very thin, and the teeth ain't through it. Right, okay, this one. Bit of a dilemma here. Always let that be a lesson. Grease those threads, but it's too late. It's interesting, you've done this twice as well. So, something you could do is lean that frame, or lay it down so it's on the left-hand side. Before you do it though, get yourself some gaffer tape or some very strong tape and cover up the hole that the crank or the axle would normally push through uh, on that left-hand bottom bracket uh, cup. So cover that up, sounds daft, maybe you could try this one, right? First of all, pour some Coca-Cola in there. Uh, what's gonna happen there is it could well break down the seizure that you've uh, had inside of that bottom bracket shell because Coca-Cola has a tendency just to work its way through anything. Of course, if you do that, you wanna make sure after you've done all of it, that you wash the bike really, really carefully inside as well. So you're gonna have to hose it all down. So it's, it's a bit of a daft thing to do, but it could well help. But uh, like you say, using a spanner like that is all well and good, but in your case, it sounds like it's really stuck in there. So what you want is one that you could attach to a socket or even inside of a vise. I'm quickly just gonna pick one up actually from the, the work station behind me. So this one here is deeper. So it's gonna go all the way over that bottom bracket. So. Go ahead, chuck that into a vise. You can get them as well uh, with, a, with a square, external square rather than the internal like this. But either way, you could probably fit a uh, 3 8 you know, bit in there and put it inside your, your vise because that's what you're gonna need, a vise. So you're gonna put it inside the vise like so. Then you're gonna lay the frame down on it. And while it's in the, in the actual uh, socket there, you're gonna use the frame like it's a giant lever, right? So then you're gonna just turn it like that, best impressions now, and it should free it up. Um, failing that, you could again use something like this because it's not gonna slip off the bottom bracket. This is what's so important. Get it through, you want it to be locked in place almost. So maybe you have to have a friend who's just helping you because we have a tendency you know, just to slip a little bit, that sort of thing. Get yourself a ratchet on there and make sure you're going in the right direction. That's the most important thing when you're doing any of anything like this, that you're going in the right direction. Then, with your ratchet bar, 
even put an extension on it. I've done some ridiculous looking things before to try and free up stuck parts and it's uh, nearly always worked. But yeah, you're gonna use some penetrating fluid, something like that first of all. Allow it to soak in there before you tackle it. That way it's just gonna try and help free up that uh, nightmare that you've created through not using grease. Let me know how you get on, mate. Right, the final question this week comes in from Andrew Ferguson. John, question for you. Layback seat posts look better than a straight one. Right, this is all subjective, but I know what you mean. Uh, is there a benefit to it, or is it purely aesthetics? Yeah, well, a laid back one, you get a slightly laid back position. Uh, so those straight ones, really they're designed for people who possibly have a shorter upper body, so they wanna get a little bit further forward, you know, because their, well, their natural proportions don't allow them to do it. Uh, but yeah, really it's about finding the right position on your bike. You can get, you know, 40 mil layback if you really look around, but most tend to be about 25, or in line is becoming increasingly popular as people try and just creep forward a little bit in their positions but ultimately it's all about finding the right position and yeah, some people I guess would say it's all about looks but don't let that influence your decision. Right I hope that I've been able to help try and solve your bike related problem. Like I said at the start if you've got one leave it down there in the comment section below and also remember to subscribe to the GCN Tech channel and click that little notification icon too so you get alerted each and every time we put a video live. Check out the GCN shop, well head on over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com we've got a whole heap of stuff for you to check out. For two more great videos just click just down here and just down here.